ሰላም ተከታተልቲ መደብ አሰና እንዚህ ከተማላ እንደና በዓድ እንግሊዝ እንዳተዳለወስ በጻሐኩም ዘሎ መደብና መደብ አሰና እዩ እዚ መደብ እዚ በዛባ ኤርትራ በዛባ ኤርትራውያን በዛባ ኤርትራውነት ንዘራረበሉ መደብና እዩ አብዚ መደብ እዚ ካበር እስቲ ወጻኢ ንብሎ ዛባ የብርናን ኩሉ ንዓና ዝምልከት ወይ ንሕና ንምልከት ወዘበለ ንማይጠሉ መደብና እዩ ነዚ ሚይጥ ነዚ ዝርርብ ከሕግስ ከአ ጋሽ ንዕድሚና ሎሙን ከም ኩልሽ ጋሻ ሒዘ መጽየለኹ شاي ارتراوي ايكونن كن عركي ارتراويان عركي ارتراني غازيتينيا مارتين بلاوت مبزحتكم تفلطو تخونو مارتين عركنا ايو مقالستنا ايو زي مدب زخاني نعون مفلاطتي حساباتون ريتوتاتون بزعبا ارتران مفلاط زدالنا يو مدبيو كلكم كتمهرولو نمارتينا صبيكم كتفلطو ايو تسمانا ሰናይ ምከተታል አብዚ ዛዕባና ብዛዕባ ሪኢቶታቱ ከምት ዝበልኮ ኢና ኽል ዘራረብ ብቋንቋ እንግሊዝ ይኽኸውን እንዳተሓጋገዝና እንዳተ ክንትርጉሞ ኢና ቅልል ድበለ እንግሊዝ ክንጥቀሚና ብስተኻለ መጠንኩም ኢና ተባሃይልና ደለና ደጊመ ሰናይ ምከተታልኩም ይዕድም ይቀነለ um martin it's an honor to be hosting you it's a bit daunting but it's still an honor to be hosting you it's a great pleasure to uh, be here thank you for coming uh, the, i mean i was explaining to our audience that this will be about um getting to know you a bit more getting to uh, know and learn about your journeys um that has brought you here to us to be i introduced you as a friend of eritrea and a friend of eritreans and you've been a great friend certainly to a lot of us that are um actively participating in the struggle for justice in eritrea um many people think you're english very very english actually and uh, uh but I know it's uh, it, it's that's not the case and I'd like to give you this opportunity to kind of introduce yourself and tell sure. us a bit about your childhood and where 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 and how you became an activist. I I'd be very happy to and uh, I do apologize for the fact that I don't speak any Tigrinya but uh, what can I say I don't. So. <laughs> I don't know why you don't. <laughs> <laughs> um well I was born and brought up in Cape Town in South Africa. and uh actually if you know the 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 famous image of South Africa is of uh Table Mountain mm. with uh, on the one side you have Devil's Peak and Lion's Head and in the middle you have Table Mountain and my parents house was the last row of houses on mm-hmm. before the it was just the mountain behind us so um it was a lovely place to to grow up very beautiful and we looked out over the the bay and the city and uh, my earliest uh, memories are of listening to the muezzin calling from the malay district which is just down the uh, the road uh, in uh, what's called the malay quarter yeah. they were not malays they were actually from indonesia but you know people <laughs> got it wrong called, yeah. exactly and so that's where i grew up i went to uh, school there i walked on the mountain i uh, used to run on the mountain i still go running Mm-hmm. uh but not on table mountain anymore and um my earliest memories really are of uh, living in south africa we brought up in south africa i was born in 1950 so i was born 2 years after the government came to power mm-hmm. that brought in apartheid so that system terrible disgusting system of racial oppression was uh, there before i was born mm-hmm. and the very worst thing that i can say about it in a sense is of course the what it did to people but to people somebody like me was that it it appeared natural mm-hmm. it was normal that there would be one doorway which said white people another doorway which said black people there would be a bench which said only for white people there'd be a train or a bus and everything was segregated and that was the way i grew up mm-hmm. and i'm afraid that, you know that that is what it was and when i walked on the mountain I could see in the distance Robben Island and we all knew that Nelson Mandela and his colleagues were in jail then it was like a terrible burden mm. even people who supported apartheid knew that it was somehow a terrible thing that had happened and for 27 years I think it was he lived on the island and in terrible conditions mm-hmm. and uh, it was shameful and anybody who lived in that time 
it bears the scars of that of that era and so it was yes i enjoyed my life as a, as a young boy but you know it, it was it was not a good period mm. how does like you know how does one get raised in, in an era and in a context where oppression and um, subjugation of a section of uh, society is considered normal and, and then rise up to fight against it, Cause, which is what mm. you and many like you did. Well, um, I suppose my parents never supported the, the National Party, which was the party of apartheid. They always supported the opposition. But, I mean, it just meant voting, and they spoke against it, but they were never particularly politically active. My, my parents had been, in the, when they were younger, active in a system of educating black people in, in night schools because the uh, schools for black people were closed down by the government so that the people had voluntary schools where they educated people at night in the evening when they were away from work. They worked on that a while, and my mother was in, involved in a protest movement called the Black Sash, which meant that the, a group of no more than five women, they were all white, used to wear a black sash and they used to stand outside Parliament when there was a, something happening and they used to stand, they were only allowed to stand, they could not sit, with, a, with placards and posters saying this is wrong and protesting against. They could not be more than five and they had to stand. My mother had terrible uh, back pain. She couldn't stand mm -hmm. and she used to bring a tiny little stool and sit down and the policeman used to come and say, you must stand. And she said, I can't. Mm -hmm. And you say, you must stand. And he said, you can't. She was an old lady. You couldn't mm -hmm. arrest her. Mm -hmm. So they used to leave her. And I suppose that kind of spirit of being involved inspired me. And when I got to university, I became involved in a movement which was beginning to uh, get involved with the black trade unions. And that was the beginning of my, activi my activity. And we used to publish some newspapers in uh, some in Oza, which is one of the black languages, and we should distribute them to black workers. Let me be honest with you, we were trying to help trade unions. We knew nothing about trade unions, but we tried. And after, it was the most successful campaign right. white students ever did, because within 18 months, the, the trade unions actually had begun to get going, and they said to us, thank you, you know nothing about <laughs> trade unions, go away, but you've, you've done a good job. Well, that's okay. so, that, <laughs> so that was very successful. Mm. I, um, I'm, I'm going to um, come back to um, you know, what brought you to the UK eventually and what have you, but um, I just wanted to stay a little bit longer with that, um, the, this, this um, idea of being uh, privileged, well, mm. relatively privileged white person mm. and, um, and, and taking the initiative to um, step out of that privilege and put yourself at risk and well, it, it's, it, it's, it's, some, it's not something that should be taken for granted. It takes some thinking and uh, understanding of uh, your own, you know, what, what you would gradually sacrifice and um, was there, how did the black people, you know, the people that you were, you were coming alongside with, how did they take it? Did well, when, you first, when we first started distributing these, these newspapers, badly printed, <laughs> mistranslated, but nonetheless they were there, um, these, I mean, people used to look, they didn't know why we were doing it, but after about a few months they stopped looking at us, they just grabbed them, stuck them under their coat and then they, they disappeared because it was sort of, it wasn't illegal but they thought they might get into mm -hmm. trouble. And um, it, was, it was a time of, it was, there was danger and uh, you know, I then in 1976 I left to Johannesburg, I'd, I'd done my first degree in Cape Town in sociology economics, I then go to, to Johannesburg to the University of the Witwatersrand where I was doing um, uh, industrial relations because I wanted to go and work with the unions and the um, of course, 76 was one of the biggest years in South Africa because out of nowhere, the children who had been told uh, by the government, you are going to be educated in Afrikaans. Now, very few of the, of the black people of Johannesburg spoke Afrikaans. Mm. In, Cape, in the Cape, there are a lot of black people who speak Afrikaans, but in the Johannesburg, area, they didn't. Mm. And so imagine that you're a shall we say, a, a science teacher in a black school and you're told you must, speak, you must teach this in Afrikaans, you don't know what to do. Yeah. They couldn't do it. The teachers couldn't do it. The, the pupils couldn't learn. 
And the pupils were so angry they went onto the streets because this was their education they were losing. And um, the first we heard was that there had been shooting in Soweto. And we, we went uh, on the campus, there was a, a big white wall, and we painted it black. And we painted up the numbers of people shot. And as the new news came in, we crossed out the numbers and we put up the next numbers. We crossed them out. And then we went onto the edge of the campus and we were protesting again with, pro with placards. We thought about 20 people had been, 20 children, 25 children mm -hmm. been shot. We were completely wrong. As many as 200 children were shot down mm -hmm. by the police with automatic weapons. Nobody knows how many. It was between 100 and 200, but terrible, terrible scenes. Mm -hmm. Now, we were, of course, a long way from Soweto, which was, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 miles away from where we were. We went onto the streets, and then we started marching. And we marched across the big bridge, which is, links the university area with the main city of Johannesburg. And uh, as we got across the bridge, there were only about 50 or 60 of us, and there were 10,000 yeah. white kids at the university, but there were about 50 or 60 of us. As we got across the bridge, black people saw us and they knew what was going on. And they poured out of the wow. office buildings, mm. out, of the, out of the building sites, and they joined us. And within about five, ten minutes, we had about five, ten thousand people behind us. We didn't know what to do. <laughs> anyway, we marched around several times around Johannesburg. And this happened the first time, we did it again. The third time we were attacked by Afrikaans students who'd been sent by the government. The government mm. had no more police to send. All the police were in, in, in Soweto. In Soweto yeah. And they sent police to try and break us up, to, 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 to beat us up. But the, we had so many people with us, mm. they got beaten up. And after that, uh, things got worse. A lot of my friends got arrested. I was followed. Things were, got tense. And I knew I was going to do a further degree in Britain. Mm -hmm. At my MA and so I left six months early because I thought I don't mind coming back and facing this but I want to get my final degree and then I'll come back and so I went to, so to Britain I came to Britain <laughs> London where no, did you I do? went to Warwick University ah. and wow. uh, I was right. there and it was very nice a very good course uh, but there was one big problem I fell in love oh Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got married and my wife said, uh, you know, I love you a lot, but I don't want to go and live in South Africa. I don't blame her. <laughs> no, exactly. And so we came to live in, in London and mm. she was a nurse and I then got various jobs. Yeah, various jobs, including the Labour Party and yes. uh, the BBC. Tell me about your time at the Labour Party. Well... I worked, I got a job with the Labour Party as an, uh, working on Africa and the Middle East. I was the, basically you had uh, an international department, I was responsible for the Africa and the Middle East and I had two committees that I serviced uh, of members of parliament and other experts and I, you know, saw and wrote papers for the committee and then the com those papers would go to the International mm. Committee yeah. and the International Committee would go to the National Executive. Wow. And then they became low party yeah. policy or not. <laughs> and um, I met many people used to come and see me from liberation movements. Because this, this is, you know, the, the 19, uh, late 1970s, many countries had only been independent for 10, 15 yeah. years. And there was still a lot of movement and uh, contacts with liberation movements um, across Africa and in the Middle East. And um, I remember very, very clearly, one day a young man came to see me, one of many who used to come and see me, he said to me, but he was different. How? Huh. He said to me, you must come to my country. And I said to him, your country? But aren't you at war? He said, yes, but you come and we'll look after you. And his name was Hermes Debesai. Hermes Debesai, yeah. Papaya. Hermes Papaya. So he said, you must come to my country, and his, his country didn't even legally exist. Exactly. He said, if you can get to Port Sudan, we'll take care of the rest. I thought, well, I don't get many offers like this. This is 1970? It was the early 1980s. Mm. must have been 82 80, or 83, yeah. something mm. like that. Mm. And... Um, so I went to my boss in the, in the Labour Party and I said to her, you know, we support the EPLF, 
we've passed resolutions saying we support them. How about I go and see them, find out what's actually happening? And she said, all right, you can go. So I went um, to Khartoum. From Khartoum, we flew to Port Sudan. And in Port Sudan, we were met by the EPLF. And they put us up at a, a, a guest house for a, a day or so. And then we, one, early one morning, we got into a, a truck and we drove out going towards Eritrea. And we're about, after about an hour, we just disappeared off into the bush. <laughs> I'll come back to that in a bit. But the Labour Party and EPLF is, is also a kind of a, a story on its own, right? Because it's not every unknown liberation movement that gets the kind of... Um, support or is it the, the no, kind no. of support because the names that we're talking about is you know Baroness Kinnock um, and Alistair Campbell and that, those that sort of caliber or, or of course they yeah. were younger and you're absolutely uh, right I mean there weren't but the the EPL have had a very good um, organization internationally and they uh, not just the EPLF other Eritrean movements the ELF as well and they had both lobbied um, on behalf of their movements and there was a general support for the Eritrean struggle on the left of British politics yeah. and there were people for example like Lionel Cliff yeah. who was an academic Basil Davidson, Basil Davidson who was yeah. probably one of the greatest African historians mm -hmm. there's ever been and he supported the EPLF as well. And I think that influenced the Labour Party. So although the Labour Party, um, you know, backed a, n a number of movements in Africa, and particularly the African National Congress in South Africa and the Pan-Africanist Congress and um, other movements in Africa, uh, you know, the EPLF was quite special because mm -hmm. it really had uh, a, a different kind of relationship with with the Labour Party because you know it seemed such a, a difficult struggle but also one that had a lot of intellectual support but don't, don't forget there were some people on the left who also backed the Ethiopian cause. That's what I was going to ask you because uh, it, it wasn't wouldn't it have been a contradiction for the Labour Party because on the other side on the Ethiopian side by this point certainly by the 1980s was a, an established um, kind of socialist um, regime as well, government as well. So um, and and backed by the by the USSR at, exactly. the, at the point. So, so exactly. So I know it was contradiction within the Eritrean movement that there's two socialist forces, if you like, uh, at a loggerhead. But for and but that's nationalism and war and what have you. But over here, in where ideologies can be kind of. Can, can have, I've got the luxury of being purists. Hmm. Wasn't it a contradiction to be backing two socialist forces? Well, there were, there were people who were particularly close to the Communist Party, the British Communist hmm. Party, who um, supported the Derg and the, the military regime in, in, uh, in Addis Ababa. But um, I think most of the academic left um, even women like Ruth First, mm -hmm. who was a member of the African National Congress and later tragically killed by the South African government with a bomb in Mozambique, um, she supported the EPLF very powerfully. Mm -hmm. And she um, you know, went and there was a hearing by the Permanent, court, uh, the permanent Tribunal of, um, which heard the Eritrean case and supported it. So there was a general feeling that the Eritreans had a genuine case and of course it was quite difficult to argue because there was a general feeling at that time that uh, African countries should not be subdivided. And so one had to then get over that hurdle and yeah. say, well, Eritrea had really always had an element of independence and it was after the uh, incorporation of Eritrea into the, into the federation by Haile Selassie mm -hmm. that this element of independence had been lost and that that in a sense was what that was being built on and the people had a right to fight for their yeah, independence. Yeah. And, 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 and it was, it was a legitimate uh, right to, you know, to, the, to the rights of self-determination. And that, that, that's what, uh, that's all it was. Yeah. Um, so you went to the fields, so to the, the liberated field, areas. Indeed, and uh, we, we drive off into the bush and there are no uh, 
there are no tracks, there's nothing. I don't know how the drivers knew where they were going. They certainly didn't look very, they didn't look where they were going. They were, there were two drivers, and it was driver and, and uh, No another. GPS. <laughs> no, and, and next to him, uh, uh, one, one of it, I think a guard, but I mean, we just drew, drove and uh, they seemed to know where they were going and it was, it, it was 36 very uncomfortable hours in a, in a 36 truck. 36 hours. Yeah, and I think we slept for about two hours in that time and then eventually we bumped up a wadi up hillside, no proper road, until eventually there was a stick across the road and a guard saying, you are entering liberated Eritrea. <laughs> we had to sign our names into a book. An um, immigration. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> immigration of a sort. And then we, we arrived there and we went into the, we were met by at the information department of the EPLF, uh, which was down in a, in a bunker. Yeah. Because of course, everything had to be in a bunker. Yeah because the Ethiopians controlled the skies yeah. and they were bombing from the air. And uh, there they had printing presses. It was amazing. I couldn't believe what, what mm. was going on. It was yeah, very tell, impressive. Tell me more about it. Like, what did you expect to find and what did you find? I had no idea what we were going to get. Um, I think one of the things that was, of course, very uh, difficult to accept was that there were no roads. Mm -hmm. There were almost no villages because, of course, the the area is yeah. right next to the next to Sudan. It was an, an area which isn't isn't even particularly populated today. I don't yeah. think. And um, we then went and we visited uh, the information department. We inf we saw some of the little schools that there were for children, uh, and then we also particularly this was very impressive. Was my wife uh, Jill was with me. And she, we went to the hospital, oh, yeah. which was a long hospital up the valley and dug in on both sides were wards. And I, I actually have photographs of mm. those wards, underground wards with men lying and men and women, patients lying in beds and being treated. And it was incredibly impressive operation. And they were doing very, very complicated operations. For example, taking bone from your hip and repairing the jaw where it had been shot away by a bullet or a bomb. And uh, my wife told me, you know, even in Britain, that's oh, yeah, a being very a nurse, difficult. Yeah. yeah, being a nurse. She said it was a very difficult um, operation to do. They were producing their own saline yeah. solution, um, which they were testing on rabbits to World Health Organization standards. Wow. Um, they were mending uh, trucks, they were mending tanks, they were mending guns. It was just extraordinary how self-sufficient they had become. And when they needed expertise, I mean, for example, if they didn't know how to do a particular operation, they flew a doctor in from a ward. They didn't send their, their own doctors. They had so few doctors. I think mm. they had only one doctor. Dr. Asafa? Well, qualified, yeah, yes. Dr. Asafa was the head of the... Exactly, um, who I remember meeting Medical him. head of charming, marvellous man. Still and is. <laughs> anyway, wonderful man. And he, uh, you know, had lots of people he was training and bringing up and explaining how to do so. He was the only one who was really qualified. The rest all learnt on the yeah. job. But they were, they were clearly extremely skilled in what they were doing. And when they needed more skills, they flew somebody in from outside. And he, he or she then did, you know, a week, ten days of very intensive work and explanation. Mm -hmm. And then they were flown out again. And I, I know you haven't, you hadn't at that point at least seen other movements or other liberation fronts or anything. But in discussions with people, was was that very different from other movements, or was it standard for the era? No, it was very, very different. It, well, I mean, for, well, the one thing that was always very different with the EPLF was that they actually held areas of land uh, and. Uh, had front lines, as opposed to, I mean, if you contrast it, say, with the TPLF in Tigray, where they didn't hold areas, they acted like most African liberation movements, which was a, 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 you know, not having front lines, but having wars of movement and where you, you attack and then you withdraw, you attack and withdraw, you go back to mountains or forests or whatever it is. And it was a completely different strategy. Mm. And uh, really quite, uh, quite unusual in, in that respect. Um, 
Do we know? Do you know uh, where um, where those ideas came? From? What what the EPL, uh, EPLF were drawing from, or was it a combination of things? I I can't the... answer that question. I'm afraid I'm not. It a would be very strategy. interesting it to. Would, it yeah. would indeed. Anyway, so th that was the f the first uh, the first time I went, and m the most difficult moment was when I was sitting in a trench uh, towards the end of the uh, the my time. And uh, I had to stay a little bit longer because I had a bit more work to do. And my wife had to go back and I, she was put on a lorry because this was the time when there were lorries coming from Sudan mm. with grain. And they brought the grain in and then they went back empty. And she was getting on a lorry that was empty going back, but she had to go by herself with, mm. with the drivers and with the EPLF. And um, I thought to, to myself, if anything happens to my wife, what will I tell her mother? Mm. Where did you leave my daughter? And I'll say, I don't know, on a hillside, somewhere. I didn't know where I was. You're giving her I had no idea. people you've never met. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so it was a bit worrying, but everything was fine. Mm. And uh, during that time, did you get to speak to um, some of the leaders and get to I understand did. the movement yes. a bit more? A bit. Um, and uh, I, uh, I also attended the first Congress of Eritrean Women and the first Congress of Eritrean Workers, yeah. which was held in the field. And there was a, a little amphitheater had been built out of stone. And uh, I mean, of course, I couldn't follow the discussions because they were in Arabic or Tigrinya or one of the other local languages. Uh, but I, I watched it happening. And um, then we also, I remember standing under the stars singing the International, oh, yeah. and people sang it in Tigrinya and in Arabic, and there were some Russians there, they spoke it in Russian, some Spanish people, they spoke sang it in Spanish, and I sang the bits I remembered in English, <laughs> which wasn't too much. Um, and then, I, now, there's one problem, which is then a few years later, I went again mm -hmm. on a second visit. This was after 1984, because I, in 1984 I left the Labour Party and went to work for the BBC. Yeah. And I went again into the, into the field on my own, not with my wife that time, and went right up to the front line. And unfortunately I cannot remember whether it was on that occasion, the second occasion or the first occasion, but I remember meeting um, Isaiah Sefwerki and um, some of the other senior um, <laughs> military people. Was Hermes's objectives in getting you uh, to come met? Have you, you know, have you spoken to him about that since? And yes, I was, I was very friendly with him. Um, and uh, it was, you know, he explained to me how the EPLF had actually started and how it had, not the, the start of the movement, but the start of the liberation struggle mm -hmm. when they landed from Yemen yeah. in the Danakil. And he described what it was like because they had to, they had to take an oasis from the Ethiopians. And if they, they said, if we didn't take it, there was no other source of water, we would have died. So we had no option. We had yeah. to take it. Mm -hmm. And they did take it. And then the Ethiopians counterattacked. And he then spent months walking through the whole of Ethiopia and back into Sudan. He walked that, that, that journey, back, yeah. an extraordinary journey. Mm -hmm. And he described a bit about what that was like and how he'd, how he'd, what he'd done and uh, his, his fighting. So we, we became friendly. And um, I mean, if one of the things that really motivates me in maintaining an interest and concern for Eritrea, it is my memory of him. Mm -hmm. Because of course, after liberation, he was then sent to China and the Far East as an ambassador and then was recalled and um, has been jailed ever since. And yeah. I know, I don't know what's happened to him. Yeah. I've spoken I don't to him think once. Anybody, yeah, I don't think anybody knows. And, and that's know. one of the tragedies of current day Eritrea, which we will come back to. But before Absolutely. that, independence then happened. Well, just one other thing I must say. On the second time I was actually in, in the field, I was taken up to um, the mountains surrounding Karen. The EPLF had pushed north, mm. sorry, not north, uh, pressed eastwards from, from the Sahel. And they were looking down. And I remember sitting in the trenches, looking down on the okay. town of Karen itself mm. and seeing, you could see in the town, the, uh, the Ethiopian troops, the tanks, 
you could see guns firing up at the trenches, you could see the, the planes coming round and dropping bombs on the trenches. Luckily they were deep trenches. Um, and uh, it was remarkable. And of course, mm. the extraordinary thing in sitting in those trenches is that you knew that you were in trenches which were, if not the same ones, very close to the ones which the yeah. Italians had dug and the British had dug during the Second World War, because of course there was almost exactly the same place the positions, yeah. as where the fighting yeah. was when the British forces came and liberated Eritrea mm. uh, mm. from the Italians. Mm. Yeah, it was arduous. It was. It has left scars, of still um, ongoing wounds. But in, independence came in 1991. Indeed. Uh, what do you remember about? Well, I remember two health? things. The first, I remember that I was asked to um, be a monitor in London for the the. Uh, well, that was 93 with the with the independence yeah, yeah. with the referendum. And that was a great honour. Mm. And I mean, the joy of people, I mean, of course, the joy in 91, but even in 93, the, when people felt, I am now going to decide the fate of my, my country and the pride that people took in that. And the, I mean, it was just a wonderful experience. But then in 91, um, I had a friend, um, Trish Silkin, who was the Oxfam representative in um, Asmara. And a few months after liberation, I went and stayed with her for about, I think it was three weeks. It was a wonderful time. I mean, there was just such a feeling of freedom. People walked up and down the streets. They could hardly contain how pleased they were that having had... Was it inevitable just before May 91? Um, did you, as somebody who's been following this for over a decade by that point, close to a decade or maybe even over a decade, but was it, was, it, was it predictable that independence would happen? I think that when by that time it was, because the, after the fall of Masawa, mm -hmm. which don't forget uh, the EPLF tried to capture once before yeah. and there were terrible losses, terrible losses the first time round. The second time was, was, was much better planned. Um, after that, and after some of the major battles where they had wiped out uh, the Ethiopian mm. armour, uh, I mean, it's just extraordinary. I mean, it really looked as if things were going against the Ethiopians at that time. It looked as if they would be successful. The big question at that period, after the fall of Masawa, was how do you take As Asmara without the Ethiopians then flattening the city yeah. by air? Mm. Mm. And that was why it was so important that the the, the attack on Asmara and Addis Ababa happened at the same time and the links with the TPLF which were very strong at that time mm. where they were they actually Ethiopian uh, the Ethiopian forces and the Eritrean forces uh, worked together to capture um, Addis Ababa and there were Eritrean troops oh, who actually mm. participated yeah. Yeah. in the liberation of uh, Tigrayan troops who participated in the liberation of Addis Ababa um, and that was absolutely vital because they, they both had to fall at the same moment. At the moment. same time. So That's quite a effort. lot to coordinate, isn't it? It was with extraordinary. Everything. Yeah. But I mean, you know, this is one of the things that one... That I had nothing but respect for the, uh, for the Eritrean people, for their extraordinary suffering mm. that they'd endured, for the, the intelligence with which they'd conducted their campaigns, um, and let me be honest, for the, the way that the EPLF had, had been led by yeah. Isaiah Safawerki, I thought, you know, it was it, amazing. I mean, there were many things I know which, were, which went wrong in that period, but also, but his leadership in that period, I think, was absolutely exemplary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the ability to hold together uh, a movement under such difficult circumstances. Yeah. And there are many, many examples. And the ability to maintain hope throughout that hopelessness. Exactly. Because, no, I mean, against all odds is no joke. It because was no it, joke. It, it, was, it was really against every odd going. Absolutely. Um, and that, also the fact that, you know, so many other movements get to a certain point and then they fracture. Yeah. And hit the EPLF was held together. That focus on. Yeah, and on, that on was, that was the extraordinary. Job done. And yeah. I, I, have, I have enormous respect for, for, for what was, what so was that's, achieved at that's that time. So that's how the kind of the, the, the war, the armed struggle ended, 91. 
but then the referendum itself was quite, you know, quite extraordinary. And it's not not just about um, how it was conducted, which is also quite extraordinary, but also the fact that mm. there was the vision to have it done. I mean, we could have ended up after all that sacrifice. We could have ended up being another. Somaliland or um, something like that. What's you know? The, the, what was? What were the drivers? Do you know? What? Well, I think that one of the one of the key points was that the EPLF thought that it was vitally important that instead of after all, when they'd taken Asmara, they could have declared yeah. independence. They decided not to because if there was ever a reverse, other people, particularly Ethiopia, could have argued, well, it was never endorsed properly, it never went through. So they said, no, we want a proper situation, we want it endorsed by the African Union, by the United Nations, then it can never be questioned. And it was a very far-sighted policy, a clever, very clever policy. Mm. And um, I think that was uh, a, a great success and it won huge support, of yeah. course. I mean, 90, I've forgotten what, 93? 98. 98, yeah, <laughs> extraordinary um, yeah. support. Um, and then, of course, the problems began. The problems. Let's talk about the problems. I, 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 I just want. I, I was actually. I'm sorry, I didn't bring it about your wonderful book, Understanding Eritrea. And I was flicking through it this morning, and um, in in that, you you've got a, quite a concise uh, analysis of what the problem is, and one of them is the personality of Isaiah Safwerki. Um, is it? I mean, what you say in that? Maybe, maybe I should let you describe how you see that, and and then I, you know, go on to my questions. Well, I think even when I met him in the field, he was always a very aloof figure. He always made it clear that um, he didn't care whether you were there or not. And um, you know, yes, he would give you an interview, but none of his answers were ever very revealing. And even at that period, he was pretty self-contained kind of individual who uh, made it clear that you were there on sufferance and mm. that uh, you know, he, had, he had no real time for anybody. Um, and he is, that was the personality he was. And I think that that, in a sense, was the great problem. He had been this extraordinary leader as a liberation in the liberation movement and ruthless, as we know. Um, but he had achieved, or he with the Eritrean people had achieved this, this extraordinary victory. But what he couldn't really do was transform himself into somebody who now had to live in a democratic situation, which after all was what the EPLF had promised the people of Eritrea all through that they would have a democracy and that they would have the right to rule themselves. And that was why people fought so hard. And he could not accept that being a Democrat meant people had to say no to him. Mm -hmm. And he thought, hang on, you know, why am I being questioned? When I was in the field, yes, I had to discuss it with my senior commanders, but then a decision was taken and I ordered, and that was it. There was never any question after that. Why am I issuing orders now? And people are beginning to say, well, no, I don't, don't think that's a good idea. This is not right. He could not accept that his vision was no longer absolute. And you cannot live in a democracy except to be contradicted by your citizens, because citizens, frankly, that is their right, is yeah. to disagree with you and to say so publicly, to th tell you that you've got the wrong ideas, and to just be open. That is why people wanted democracies, mm -hmm. to have the rights to have their own views and have their own views heard. And there were some early indications of that which were very worrying but nobody quite understood it at the time. One was the way that women were treated. You know, that the, uh, the, there was, you know, a lot of them were told, you know, yes, you'd fought well, but now I think that's enough. And, uh, which I'm afraid happens in many wars, not only yeah. in Eritrea. Um, there was also the way that the disabled, who had been treated with great respect in the field, but when they were no longer in the field, you remember there was the demonstration oh, right, yeah. Yeah. and the, they, they marched from the, the, the area where they were being treated or living into, into Asmara to look for, ask for better treatment and they were met with brutal force yeah. and that was unforgivable. Mm -hmm. And then finally when the troops finally say, look, we can't go on living like this, we need to have some pay and they, they went round town 
not having him uh, trying to overthrow the government, just saying, come and listen to us. And they shot in the air and they got his size to come and speak to them in the, uh, you know, and he did. And then he promised he would listen. And then he locked up all the, uh, the mm -hmm. leaders and shot them. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm afraid, you know, after that, people thought, no, oh, this is really not what was promised. Mm -hmm. And, well, then you have all the mistakes that lead up to the, the war in 98 uh, with, the, with, the, with um, Ethiopia, which was you know, another 100,000 lives on, on whether they're Ethiopians or Eritreans, I don't care, they're still lives. Um, and uh, the tragedy that, that that involved, and then following that, the, the whole issue with the G15 and the... the when people began to question him, say, look, you know, this is really not where we should be going. And he just crushed them and he crushed the student movement and the journalists. And, well, and here, here we, we are. are. <laughs> yeah, here we are. Uh, just before I uh, go on to last year and the peace accord and what have you, I, uh, what does the world make of us? I mean, um, I, as an Eritrean, I kind of know what my people say about what's going on, how we have started looking at ourselves. Uh, but, you know, the contrast between the Eritreans that were the coordinated, the organized, the sustainability and all of that with, to, with the current status of Eritreans. What does the rest of the world see? I think the rest of the world sees a situation which they don't really understand because they, I think the, the great difficulty is that the, the situation is one of, there's not a, there isn't, the country isn't falling apart except in a very slow, gradual way. So they think, well, it must be fine, things must be all right. Why up, you know, they don't really understand that there is, you know, how much anger and how much suffering there is, but quiet suffering, quiet despair. And I think that is what is so hard for the outside world to understand. And don't forget that, you know, there are so many crises around the world. If there isn't a, an immediate crisis that had to be answered today, people think, oh, well, we'll put that off for an, another day. And so people, I mm. think the international, it's difficult for the international community to respond. very difficult to make sense of it, isn't yes. it? Also to make it, to put it on the agenda without putting it in a way, um, uh, you know, forcing it onto the agenda. Because exactly. if it can be ignored, it will be ignored. Exactly. Um, and w against that, we've got the movement that I'm a part of, that you're a great supporter of, uh, where a lot of hard work goes in. Um, and again, I don't quite know what, the, the, what, what to make of the results that we are getting because I'm part of it. But what do you make of it? We try so hard at the UN, in, in our respective capitals, um, wherever we can. What do, you, what do you make of our struggle for justice in Eritrea from the diaspora? Well, I think that things have been transformed. I mean, I remember 10, 15 years ago, uh, you know, when you met Eritreans, the vast majority of them thought that the government was more or less doing the right thing. Yes, there might have been some issues, but they were generally supportive. Um, you know, even, even members of the opposition, even, you know, people who'd been ELF, thought, well, you know, they face an enemy in, in Ethiopia, we've got to give them some room for manoeuvre, our national sovereignty is, is so much more important. And um, today that has been transformed. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, uh, the ability of the PFDJ and the regime to control the diaspora, and let's not, let's not underestimate it, I mean, as you know better than I do, the pressure that there is on people to conform mm. has been enormous. And the, the work of the various, um, shall we say, organizations within, the, um, within the, the, the PFDJ run, the YPFDJ, the what's it, 0309, all the other organizations that are used to penetrate, disrupt, um, disorganize uh, the opposition have been, were really powerful. And today they are the ones who are on the run. Yeah. They are now, I mean, look at what happened in Norway um, a couple of weeks ago. You know, they are being disrupted and they are finding it increasingly difficult 
to um, operate inside the diaspora and uh, in the in, in an international environment. So internationally things have certainly transformed and while the, uh, the Eritrean government uh, has now broken out of some of the restrictions that were placed mm -hmm. on them, particularly frankly by the uh, Somali government, the Djibouti government and the Ethiopian government and uh, through the intervention of the Saudis and the UAE um, and the transformations in the other countries as well. And they are the Eritrean government at the international level is much more um, assertive. So, for example, in, uh, in the Khartoum process, the Eritrean government now, for example, is chairing that yes. process, which is a key relationship between the European Union and mm -hmm. Africa. Um, but amongst the people on the ground, they're not making headway. Mm -hmm. In fact, quite the opposite. Right. So there's room for hope, <laughs> hopefulness. Absolutely. I know you'd say there always is, but... Um... No, no, there genuinely is. And, you know, the one thing you can, one can be absolutely certain of is that regimes do not, that do not uh, represent their people and do not represent the, the, the views of the majority of their people do not last. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can control them, but eventually things fall apart. And, uh, you, you know, you can never predict how that will happen. Particularly but, when you don't understand quite how it's exactly. working. But the one thing I'm absolutely certain of is that it, it should be the, uh, it, this should be undertaken by the Eritrean people and by nobody else. Mm -hmm. It is the responsibility of the Eritrean people and nobody else should uh, be involved. Yes, one can support people. I, I, you know, I would always back the rights of all people to have human rights. It is our, all of our human rights are enshrined in the United Nations Constitution, which guarantees us those human rights. When, we, when I demand them for, for South Africans, I demand them for Eritreans. Mm. But it, in the end, this work must be done by Eritreans. Yeah, and on that note, I, I would very much th like to thank you, Martin, for what has been a, 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 an amazing time for me, certainly, <laughs> because it just you can go round and round uh, in circles but to, to be able to identify the beginning of where you got involved and where we are at now and uh, what continue you know what needs to continue what we need to hold on and um, continue with um, thank and, you for that and I look forward to buying you a cup of coffee in Asmara oh wonder I'll hold you to that one <laughs> would you like to um, uh, conclude with um, directly speaking to the to, to people in, in Asmara, head of that coffee actually, and all over Eritrea because that's that's where um, this should be uh, this this sort of discussion should be held, and I'm sure people would like to hear um, what you've got to say directly to them. Well, I, I would just say to all Eritreans, both in the diaspora and uh, in uh, Eritrea itself that I have the greatest respect for, for you and your people and your culture um, of all your, uh, your many, uh, you know, di in your diversity and in your unity. Um, and I, I wish you the very best uh, in the years ahead and that uh, this regime can be ended and that you can live in the peace and the security and prosperity, for goodness sake, that you deserve because I only have to see how um, people, how well Eritreans have done around the world. I know many of them who have been very successful. And really, you need those people to be coming home, to be investing in your own country, and to be building the prosperous and happy and joyful Eritrea that you all deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. ታታት <laughs> ባሰናት ንኸሎኽ ንገብር ክንፍትን ኢና ስለምክተታልኩም የመስግን ሰናይ ቀንያት